Welcome to everyone that is joining us. Um, we're, we just opened the webinar, so we're going to allow several minutes for people to join. Um, we have a great presentation for you today, and I'm so excited with our uh, guests. I hope you are excited as well. If you're here, it's probably because you want to learn about gardening. Um, personally, I can't keep any plants alive, so I hope to learn a lot today and, and really grow. <laughs> And we'll start in about two minutes. For those of you joining us, um, we're just going to wait a couple minutes for everyone to file into the webinar and then we'll get started. We appreciate your patience. All right. Well, good evening. My name is Bryce Roberto, and it is my immense pleasure to welcome you to our Adulting for Anteaters Gardening for Small Spaces webinar. I am the vice chair of the Young Alumni Council, which creates programming like this to help all anteaters navigate the world. Tonight, our special guests are from the University of California Cooperative Extension Master Gardeners Program. Our primary speaker is Brian Hale who has been gardening for over 60 years. We are joined by other UC Master Gardeners, Arlene Finke, Tom Farrell, Linda Jenis, who will be monitoring the chat to answer your questions during Brian's presentation. Feel free to ask questions using the chat or Q&A functions at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Without further ado, I will turn it over to Brian Hill. Well, thank you so much, Bryce. I sure appreciate it. And I am really excited to be here. Uh, this is small container gardening, but it's also going to be basic gardening. And if you're really into it, and I hope I inspire you to be so, we're going to make sure you're growing the right stuff right off the bat because seasons are very, very important. So there I am. I've been a master gardener since 1999. Uh, fruits and vegetables. We have, uh, as part of the master gardening program, we are part of the University of California Cooperative Extension and there is a research station, the South Coast Research Station in Irvine, and they have professional greenhouses. So it says I'm able to grow a thousand tomato plants. I'm kind of the tomato guru, if you will, and proud to be so. So whenever the greenhouse is available in the early spring, we grow a thousand tomato plants, and of course, give them the way to master gardeners, school gardens, and other, other uh, entities such as that. So I'm kind of, uh, I'm, I'm just into it. This is a nice little statement. I'm art and design and create beautiful and purposeful garden spaces. Um, I'll go with that. So anyway, here we go. This happens to be my garden. Um, we're gonna talk about small spaces. I happen to be lucky enough to have a big space because I've been in the gardening for so very, very long. Uh, when I bought my house, it was almost based on this backyard's too steep, this backyard's got too much shade. So one of the priorities when buying this house uh, 30 years ago was, is there a place for my garden? So with that said, we're gonna learn this today. Uh, we're gonna learn about basic gardening and then making sure you're growing the right stuff by way of cool season vegetables. Obviously with fall right on our heels here, uh, it's important to know and to grow the right vegetables. They're very, very uh, particular. In other words, you wouldn't want to start necessarily uh, a summer vegetable, uh, you know, squash or other things like that now because it, the days have gone shorter and they're about to get cooler. Basics, that's, uh, we're gonna call that vegetable garden basics. We're just gonna call that basic gardening. Growing seeds and transplants in ground, raised beds and containers. Um, we're going to specialize in containers today, but we'll follow this format and we'll bring it up. By the way, as Bryce mentioned, if you have any questions, just push the chat. Uh, we have a lot of master gardeners, as he mentioned, that can answer the questions right then. If it's pertinent and it really pertains to what I'm talking about, then I'll be glad to answer them. And we also are going to talk about a very important subject, integrated pest management. We call it IPM for obvious reasons. 
So first of all, let's go right to, to basic gardening and gardening in smaller spaces. The, uh, a garden has certain requirements. First and foremost is location. So growing, whether it's in a container, in the ground, or whatever the case may be, vegetables and, uh, require a minimum of six hours of sunlight. All day is perfect, six hours is a minimum. So when you're growing in a container, you have the opportunity, if need be, to put it on wheels, literally. So if the sunlight is favorable in the morning, you roll it over there, you get back from school, you get back from work, whatever your case may be, and it's more favorable in the afternoon in another position, you literally roll it over there. So if you can't have full, full sun. So also important is besides location, in a container, obviously, accessibility to water is a no-brainer. But if you're growing on the ground, you have to keep that in mind. Are you prepared to hand water every day? Are you gone uh, to visit friends, parents, whoever, at any given time for three or four days at a time, which means they're not going to get watered unless it's an automatic waterer? So these are all things you have to keep in mind as your personal individual case may be. They have to get watered and they have to have full sun. We're gonna talk about the importance of soil as it comes up on some of these slides here. So let's move forward then with those base talk about uh, why to garden in the first place. Well, garden has got extremely popular with COVID and actually, out of all bad things, some good things happen. And I think COVID's gonna end up with a bunch of positives because the gardening scene these days is unbelievable to try to get any resources. Uh, it just, I recommended a, a book by Pat Welsh, the Southern California gardener. One of my employees, his wife is into gardening and she's planting stuff that shouldn't really be planted. She's trying to plant peppers starting now. They're a warm season long daylight type of crop. So although it may get a couple of peppers, it's not gonna be the successful plant you're hoping for. So timing is really, really important. So he went to get the book I recommended and it's all sold out. So that, I, I almost was shocked when he said that, well, it's sold out. He found it used somewhere, but it's amazing. A book like that has been on the shelf forever and ever. Pat Welsh is a, is a famous gardener from England, she used to have a TV program probably long before most of you were around, but uh, to have that book sold out, it's amazing. It just speaks to the popularity of gardening. So when you garden, undoubtedly, you cannot beat the taste of a homegrown fruit or vegetable. I like to grow lots of lettuce. They're a short season or a short daylight, cool season crop. And there's nothing, and they're easily grown in a barrel or a container. There's nothing like taking the salad spinner out there, picking the lettuce, the desired amount, 10 or 12 varieties. There's hundreds available. And we're gonna cover that too here. Uh, taking it in the house, rinsing it, spinning it, little, little uh, salad dressing, and within 20 minutes, you're eating lettuce at you cannot, even at a farmer's market, if you're lucky enough to get there and it's 24 hours old, still delicious, still great. But when you allow yourself the uh, ability to pick and eat immediately, the natural sugars that are there immediately play through the taste. You know, that's really what makes a fresh vegetable. Is it fresh? Is it current? So once you pick a vegetable, those natural sugars slowly break down at different rates into starches and some of the sweetness goes away. I did a school garden for 12 years. Kids hate beets. I always grew beets and I always primed them. When these beets get big enough to eat, we're gonna have a red tongue contest. So they were excited about that. But when you pick a beet, I had a little burner, cut it in small pieces and within the time of the class, I was able to get them cooked, pass them out, they were excited about getting their tongues red, but they were really being fooled because these beets were so fresh and so full of natural sugars and flavor, they loved them. And I honestly believe to this day, because that was years ago, I did it for 12 years. Uh, to these days, some of them are still eating vegetables that they may not have eaten if they hadn't had this kind of exposure. So it really speaks to 
you cannot beat the test of the taste. Varieties, you know, the big box stores, they may be, let's just, let's just use lettuce for fun. They might have five or six varieties. The local nurseries do a much better job, the little nurseries, they may have uh, 15 or 20. But if you look at a seed catalog, there are hundreds. They all describe the flavor, the taste, how big they grow and so forth. So uh, the varieties are just fantastic. Nutritional value, of course. In my particular case, and this is not necessarily a master gardener deal because there are other considerations, but my garden has to be pure organic. I know exactly what the fertilizer is, what the soil is, no GMO seeds, and you are growing the most nutritional food you possibly can. Fun, you can see this happens to be a master gardener friend of mine, that's his grandson. They're picking those vegetables. Uh, it's, it's, it's fun to garden if you're really into it. And if you can introduce kids to it, like I just described, it's a great thing. And the teachable moment, moments I just described. So I want to make sure I stay with the basics, what this program's about and about container gardening. So these happen to be some of my crops. I'm proud of those. Obviously, you can see what they are. Uh, but they're, these are not necessarily container friendly. You could certainly do onions, but you would only have onions in there. They're very easy to grow. Onions happen to be one of those things that are sensitive, as I described, to the day length. Here in Southern California, we're considered a short season. Maybe moving into the middle of the country is, is a normal season and then up Washington and north would be called a long season because as we know, the sun sets much later in the evening in the summertime as we go north. So when you buy an onion seed, you, you don't necessarily know if it's short season. When you have the right access to this stuff, you can buy, those are particularly short season onions. Plant them in December, those are picked in May. They're little tiny dry looking things and uh, what was $4 in a, a little pack of dried up looking onions turns into 70 pounds of onions in this particular case. Uh, disease resistance, well, I, I missed. Uh, vegetables you like to eat, obviously, you're only gonna grow what you're gonna eat. Uh, disease resistance, in a container, you're not gonna have too much of a problem, but you need to be aware. Uh, so, like for example, if you're gonna grow a tomato and you're gonna go to the store and buy a tomato, you may or may not have seen, maybe you're not used to it, but you will see at some point, celebrity comes to mind, one of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of varieties. It has a list of, of letters, T, F, N, and so forth. So these are bred and hybrid to be resistant to fusarium, tobacco, mosaic, uh, soil-borne nematode, stuff like that. So you can buy some that has this resistance built into them, but what we're gonna talk about today, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold too much to that right now. Color for vegetables, just pick what you want, what you like to eat. Uh, and then by trial and error, I happen to this year have grown the best eggplant I've ever grown. I always put my eggplant in in April, but for reasons because my garden was full, I just didn't have the opportunity, it wouldn't fit. So as my corn came mature and came out in June, I decided what the heck, I'll throw some eggplant in there. And as long as I've been gardening, there's a lesson every single year. And I now know as I pick a three pound eggplant this morning that I'm about to have for dinner, it's a timing issue. They prefer to be planted later. That's a lesson. That's the more you grow, it's like anything else in life. What you do gives you an experience for the future. This is not my garden, but it's a perfect example. It doesn't have to look perfect. You just have to make sure you're dealing with the basics. <clears throat> you can see those paths there with the weeds in them and so forth. That's fine, you're not growing there, but where they are growing the vegetables, you don't walk on that. You don't wanna compress the soil, it's very important. Again, if, it's, if I'm mostly talking to people that are gonna be into containers, you, you don't have to worry about that too much, but you may be growing in the ground also. If you're not in a raised bed, and you're in this typical garden uh, setup, you'll have walking paths and you'll never walk on the soil where you're planting the vegetables for the compression areas I just described. So in this case, you got lettuce in the front, 
you got snow peas growing up the trellis um, and to the right looks like lettuce nice thing about lettuce you can plant it real thick it needs to be thin so it can be a nice mature plant but in the thinning you have it's not officially micro lettuce that's a whole nother group of vegetables but it can be consumed like that so you thin them and you've got some nice micro vegetables now i'm gonna take this opportunity i know questions are being asked so are, are there any questions right now for me at this point <laughs> great okay I we have a about couple questions best. brian go ahead bryce one question is will you share your slides with our attendees will uh, you share your presentation with our attendees it's being recorded right yeah Correct. It's, it's being recorded it, so it's available tom tom's the master of this tom what's the answer to that well i think uh, the fact that it's recorded and there was an earlier question uh, it's going to be on youtube so the the people have uh, a chance to look at this uh, several times, I think. It's going to be on YouTube? I didn't know that. I better do a better job. I better step <laughs> up the game. Good Lord, I didn't know that. I was just faking it so far. <laughs> anyway, we talked about the best site. This happens to be my garden. I'm fortunate enough to have enough room, as I think I mentioned earlier. So I've got raised beds. Um, and. Uh, it's a beautiful way to go. Nothing gets walked on, the soil's nice and so forth. So best site we've talked about, the right plant, I believe we talked about. Sunny level, I don't know about level, because when you're trying to garden and you've got some space and it's not perfectly level, garden there anyway. So um, access to water. We mentioned that if you, if, if you travel, or not necessarily travel a lot, but if you're not necessarily home on the weekends or you're, or you're away or whatever the case may be, water is going to have to be done automatically or you're going to have to have a friend water now i have all the automatic everything but i still as i'm away a week or 10 days at a time i have my neighbor come down to just check on the garden and usually that's a pretty easy deal because when they're checking on the garden they've got 10 days of your fruits and vegetables so it's like come on down yeah take some vegetables so i have plenty of volunteers to keep an eye on my garden when I'm out of town. Uh, plenty of space, eh, it's nice. In my case, I have the luxury of plenty of space, but you may not have it. Take the space you have and use it wisely. And we're gonna talk about what you can plant in a container shortly. Drainage, critical. You know, you can always bring a plant back from a little being underwatered, but once it gets overwatered and there's rot beginning at the root and base of the, uh, of the plant level, you cannot recover. So drainage for that reason is really, really critical. Now position of the garden is also critical too. You'll see this garden here with north, as you may or may not be aware in Southern California, the sun is in the south sky. And in the wintertime, it really drops. So it's important when you pick a garden, whether it's summer, it's still in the south sky in the sky, summer, it's just a little bit higher in the sky, that as we look at this diagram, the plants in the back closest to the end or at the top of this picture are the tallest. Let's just say those are tomatoes, which are gonna be one of the taller things you grow in your garden. If you plant them in the front down there at the bottom, they're gonna shade everything else in the back. So it's important to read the seed packet, be aware of the height. If you're container gardening and you're on wheels, you can always roll it in any direction. But if your container gardening and it's hard to move and you want to get enough in your container, whatever is the tallest, grow it on the north side. And thanks to all our cell phones, that's just a quick compass, boom, boom, you know north instantly. Then these plants in this example, so I would give this a hypothetical of tomatoes in the back. The next row would be something like peppers. The next row, they look like beets. Beets grow pretty tall. Uh, the, the plant portion of them, then lettuce, maybe cilantro or parsley, and down the line, radishes and so forth. So just be aware of that, it's very important. So as it says, use your space efficiently. Make a map, may or may not be important. Uh, draw your vegetables on a map. Now in my case, I'm really, as I told you, I'm really, really into tomatoes. So I will label all the tomatoes in their position in my garden 
And like I did as the tomatoes start to slow down just last week, I'll go around and grade them on a five being the best to one. Actually, I quit at three. I figured if there's no number after three, I'm not growing it again. So every single year, I try to pick out the winners and the ones I will definitely grow again. Those are a five plus. There's no doubt I've got three or four or five plus. Those will be grown again. So keep track, and that's what drawing vegetables on a map's about. Planting dates. I've already told you how I've learned this year that planting eggplant later as it's a little bit warmer makes a big difference. So I'm going to keep track of that date. And a garden journal, that's up to you, depending on how much you're into it. You can, uh, you can keep track of, hey, this worked good, this didn't. I planted this on this date and this on this date. And then you can, you can judge yourself. So those garden boxes you just saw are completely full of this ProMix BX. It's kind of expensive. You can get it at, there's a version of it at big box stores. This particular place I go, Orange County Farm Supply in Orange, uh, has it. And that's what my garden has, that and the soil building conditioner, which is basically organic compost. Now I compost, I've got a tumbler, I've got the room, and I also add my own compost. But at the size of my garden, I can't make enough compost for the needs I have. So as the seasons change as they are now, the tomatoes are starting to come out and so forth, I need to replenish that soil. So. Once I have my basic soil, I only add compost from that point forward. If you are growing in a container, make a note of that mix right there. It's three cubic foot. There is a lot of soil in there. That'll fill a couple of half whiskey barrels if that's what you're using. 10 foot, or I'm sorry, 10 gallon black plastic pots. That'll fill a couple of those. And you can grow a lot of vegetables in, in that small area. We're going to uh, get to my recommendations here shortly. But topsoil sounds good, sounds great. It's basically sandy loam. It wants to compact quickly There's because there's sand in it and so forth. Not a bad thing to, in your yard to grow grass on or plant a tree in or maybe even in an orchard. But if you're going to do a container garden, I recommend you use that pro product right there. Just for fun, you see the word mycorrhizae there. That just happens to be a fungi related to mushrooms that has a symbiotic relationship with plants. This fungi under the soil attaches itself to the roots of plants. In doing so, it feeds itself, but also acts uh, as a additional nutritional uptake area to help its the plant it's attaching itself to. So mycorrhizae is a, uh, I'm gonna give you a second in case you wanna write that down before I screens and now that I brought it up and just look that up and you'll see what it's about. It's, it's a great natural occurring way to help your plants thrive, mycorrhizae. The famous NPK, whether you garden a lot or a little, at some point you've seen those three, uh, three call outs, the NPK, nitrogen, you can see it here on the screen, phosphorus and potassium. As it says there, nitrogen is encouraged leaf growth, phosphorus, flowers, seeds and roots, potassium, fruit. Also, potassium has the ability to help the absorption of the other two. Now, there are 21 micronutrients for a plant, but these first three are the most common and the ones that need replacing more than the rest. So if you get down to feldspar or boron or manganese, that hangs in the soil for a long, long time and you generally don't have to worry about those components. These are the ones that the plants take up most of the time. Friend came to me one time and said, man, I grew the, the, the tomato plant you gave me? Yeah, put it in a garden, it's unbelievable. It's huge. He said, well, I can't get no tomatoes on it. I said, well, tell me about it. He said, well, the leaves are huge. The stems are huge. It's a great big plant, but no tomatoes. Well, come to find out, he used manure in the amending of the soil. Manure is mostly nitrogen. So he didn't allow enough phosphorus for this to want to produce flowers. And then flowers in all plants end up, well, in all fruits end up being uh, where the fruit comes from. So you have to be aware of that. So this is the kind of thing I'm hoping I'm imparting some wisdom on you here to, to be aware. This is, a, this is a science, it's a simple science, 
but you need to know. So we talked about day length, the season, and now we're talking about fertilizer. So you really need to know. Manure always sounds good. Maybe your mother or father put it on their lawn and you have this in your mind, oh, manure is good for the plants. And it certainly is to some degree, but you gotta be careful in its application. Any more questions at this point, people? All right. Ryan? Yes, go ahead. Um, one of the attendees had a question about what are five plus tomatoes? Meaning, I'm sorry, I'm, I, maybe I didn't make that clear. I do a map of my garden and I have all their names when I first put them in the ground. I have little tags, but the sun seems to fade those little sticks I use to identify them. So I immediately identify them on a piece of position. I then grade them with five being a really good tomato that I was happy with. And a one being I'm not planting that again. So the five meant I want to plant that again. And when I put the five and the plus on it, that means definitely next year buy those seeds again. I definitely want them. So I'm sorry if I confused you on that, <clears throat> but that's my own personal. A five plus for me means it's a great tomato and it's going to be planted again. And it's funny, all those five and five pluses seem to show up every year over and over again. Because where you are, your position and so forth uh, in the county, you know, some of you are, call, are, are, are in from, let's say, closer to the ocean. You know, you got a little different climate down there. I know I have some friends that live in the Corona Del Mar. When we go down for a summer, I'm here at, at 93 degrees. When we get down there, it's about 74. So we have to dress for a much cooler climate on a hot day. So you need to be aware of that, too, what type of uh, microclimate you live in, which are several for that very reason, ocean exposure, valleys, hillsides. In my case, uh, in Anaheim, uh, a lot of Santa Anas that may not occur at the ocean or let's say, you know, in a flatter where it's spread out toward LA and, and uh, Northwest Orange County. So this just talks about what I talked about as far as the different fertilizers and their NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash uh, numbers. Miracle-Gro, we've all heard of that. I personally don't use it. A 462 is organic. I, I use something in that category, and fish emulsion is always good because it's a mild. That's really good when you first start planting. It's not, you see, none of the numbers are huge. They're not going to burn the plant. Let's talk about when to fertilize just for fun. Whether you're in a pot, the ground, it doesn't matter. The first of the month is what I use just as a reminder. So I don't have to think about, did I fertilize two weeks ago, three weeks ago? I know it's the first of the, every single month, whether it's a cool season or warm season garden, then it's time to fertilize. And I usually fertilize on a little weaker solution than recommended by the manufacturer. Remember, with that mycorrhizae soil I've described, organic compost, you've got microbes in there that are doing their job and providing all the nutrients the plants need. So. However, like a tomato, a very, very hungry, as far as fertilizer goes, plant, it, it needs some attention. It just can't go the entire three months of its production without some help. As Tom mentioned, I don't know if we were on air or when we were talking amongst ourselves, he's got a, he grows in pots, and his to, to, one of his tomato plants provided 24 pounds of tomatoes growing it in a pot. That's a lot of tomatoes. You know, if they're, if they're a pound a piece, that's, that's 24, that's, that's a, big pack of tomatoes, so they need food. So just keep that in mind. You can also tell if something goes yellow, it's just not looking good, whatever, you need to fertilize. My recommendation, once a month, a little weaker solution than recommended by the manufacturer. So this is basically, let's say, what, three to four inches tall at the first blossom. Yeah, you don't wanna, you don't wanna put a brand new plant in, whether you, trans, you started it from seed or bought a four inch pot, those are pretty much ready to go. Give them a few weeks to get ready, then you can start fertilizing them. Here are the recommended every 30, uh, three to four weeks. And in containers, matter of fact, I'm glad I read that as to remind myself. When you're planting a container, that water is flushing out of there at a bigger rate than it would be in a, in a normal ground garden. So those need a little more food a little more often. There's a thing some people do, they, they, they water, they fertilize weekly, weekly. That's W-E-E-K and W-E-A-K. 
a weaker solution more often. Weekly, weekly, kind of cute. <clears throat> Growing seeds, whether you're in a pot, ground, doesn't matter. Uh, some seeds are so easy to grow. Lettuce, for example, uh, radishes, and some don't want to be transplanted. Carrots, beets, anything that's kind of a below ground root uh, vegetable uh, doesn't do well transplanting. Once you get to garden and you're looking on, you know, different, uh, act, uh, you, you look things and on how to do it, you'll, you'll find out beans, for example, they don't like to be transplanted. So, uh, but planting from seed is very, very economical and very, the best way to go. When you buy a tomato at a big box store, they're one little tomato for $3.98, which as a tomato nut and grown them from seed forever, it's like, oh my gosh, you can buy a whole pack of tomato seeds for $2.49 and there's 30 seeds in there. So do the math. <laughs> You've got several years of tomato plants at a reasonable price. And back to what I originally talked about, you have hundreds and hundreds of varieties that to, to choose from. So seeds from transplants, either way is good to go. We've talked about amending the soil in my case, and I recommend your case, strictly amend it with compost. I happen to grow just because I think they look good and I like the little bit of shade. And by the way, finches love them, and that is sunflowers. They eat the leaves of all things. When I first saw the damage to my sunflowers, I thought it was insects and it kind of disturbed me. When I realized the finches were eating it, I thought, oh, well, have at it. I'm happy with that. But um, when you pick one of those out, you take, it's a giant root and you're taking a bunch of soil out with it as much as you try to shake it off. So that's the reason you want to keep adding compost because you are taking soil out of the garden. If you're lucky enough to have a compost tumbler, you can throw it in there. Seeds and transplants I just talked about. These happen to be cool season. So if you, we are talking basic gardening and we are talking small containers. So this is the part I really wanted to share with you. And let's use a whiskey barrel. Everybody knows what a half a whiskey barrel looks like, the size of it and so forth. Uh, you could grow carrots in there at the broccoli and cauliflower. Those are big, massive plants. You could get two in each one. But let's face it, as much fun as that might be to have your own big cauliflower, uh, when you're growing in containers, and so you wanna utilize a space. So I wouldn't recommend those necessarily. The lettuce, even snow peas, uh, you put a trellis in that, in that container, they grow fast. Unlike other plants, they don't need to be thinned. You know, normally you grow stuff real close together and you go back and you have to thin it out. Snow peas, don't care. Uh, they only grow three or four feet tall, a small trellis, a small anything, a good production, quick production. They grow extremely, extremely fast. I swear when I go out and pick mine and I will pick that and plant what I consider bare naked, leaving just maybe the one inch ones long. And I've got every single mature snow pea I could possibly pick. Two days later, it's, in, it's full of snow peas again. I often thought to myself, I'm going to sit out there one day and actually watch them things grow, but <laughs> I'm not that crazy. So onions and so forth, those are fun. You know, onion sets, you're not going to be able to grow those big in, in a container, those big onions I had, but um, the onion sets, the one on the uh, bottom second from the left, you can buy those onion sets. They turn into what's on the right there. Those happen to be started with red onion sets. Those happen to be uh, yellow onions but they're great for cooking, they're easy to grow, they grow quick, you can, every time you pick one, put another one in there. That is a great thing, especially if you like cooking, to, to add that to, to, your, to your meal. Radishes are easy. Potatoes, if you dedicate a container just to potatoes. Number two, there are for sale, like canvas bags. So you take the bag, fill it full of soil, and then you can grow potatoes in there also. By the way, if you're really desperate and you're really inspired and none of what I said works for you, get a bag of soil and stick the plant right in it, cut the bag open, plop it on the ground and grow something right in that bag. Now, maybe not that's the best way, but I'm, I'm trying to cover everybody's bases here. I'm not gonna go into the different varieties, that's not important. So here are some lettuces, cut and come again. You'll notice what that says there. When you grow leaf lettuce, which I love to grow. 
you can cut it off and it will grow back. In my case, it's also favorable to take the outside leaves, harvest those, and it constantly grows and grows and grows. When you do a head lettuce, uh, whether it's bib or uh, iceberg or whatever, once you cut that off, that's pretty much done. You've harvested the entire plant. So I like to have enough lettuce out there. In a container, you can grow a lot of lettuce. I think that is probably a great way to start if you want to be a container grower. Do some, do some lettuce, do some carrots, and give them enough room. And in a whiskey barrel, I'm only using that as a reference consistently here, you can grow enough lettuce to pick. You'll have lettuce for two people for the entire cool season. That's how successful they are. So I'm going to start my lettuce about November into the garden. I'll start, the, uh, the, I'll start them from seed uh, in late October once I transplant them, it's November, and then I'll replant them again in about February, because at some point, as you keep picking the outside leaves, they will get wore out, but then you can have another set. So planting in a, in a succession for three weeks apart gives you a long term or long time uh, ability to, to pick. Any questions yet? All right, these are just different herbs. Cilantro, dill wheat, I won't go into them. Arugula, you know, it's really popular in Europe. It's called rocket lettuce. My wife loves it. I always make sure I have arugula. It's really good. It's nice to mix in with everything. Um, and we're not going to talk about that too much. Here happens to be, even though we're talking cool season and we're talking planting in pots, these are tomatoes that you need to start during the cool season in February. So I'm just making that note and then those transplant up. So uh, I've talked about. Uh, direct versus growing transplants, sterile soil. What that's basically referring to is those containers you see there in the picture, I'm gonna use them again next year. So any disease or any lingering, whatever that may have been in those containers, when I grow them next year, I just put them in a big tub, two or three drops of bleach, a ton of water, just to break any little pathogen that may be lingering from last year's plant. So you wanna keep them clean. Seed size, it's pretty simple. It's going to tell you on the packet how deep, but if you lose a packet or whatever, it's generally you're going to plant that seed about the depth the size of the seed is. So parsley is a little tiny piece of pepper looking seed that's almost on the surface. Bean, we know what a bean looks like. That's going to be at least a half inch deep and everything in between. That deals with planting. Brian, I've got a good question here for yes. you. You might want to answer. Sure. Uh, it's pretty timely. The question basically is there's been so many recent recalls of vegetables because of co contamination. How do you prevent that in your own personal garden? That is a good question. You know, contamination, we've all seen at some point those pickers that are, no one wants to do that job. God bless those people. Seriously, they're busting their butt. But there's a lot of people handling a lot of fruits and vegetables. I don't know how E. coli or some of those other things get in there, but when you're picking them in your own garden, you should not have any problem whatsoever. So I hope that answer, answers the question, but what happens on a big giant commercial farm and what happens in your garden is two completely different things. If that doesn't answer, chat back in and uh, I'll clarify that a little bit more. Hope that, that covered it for you. Spacing and thinning, we all know it. Let's use a carrot, for example, the size of a carrot. We've seen them in the store, we know. But when you plant carrots, they're actually sweet little tiny plants. And then, you know, they're just all planted together. They might be right on top of each other, a couple of seeds. But we all know what size a carrot is. Let's just call it uh, an inch across, an inch in diameter. So, and you need a little room in between. So let's just say that's a half an inch, an inch in between and a half. That's in the middle of each carrot, of course, that's two inches. So you need to thin these little tiny carrots as they start to get a little bit bigger, about two inches apart for the good production. So thinning, you really need to realize whether it's carrots or whatever else you're growing, what size is it as an adult? And of course, you're all gonna know whatever you're planting, what a mature plant of that variety may be. And allow, just picture yourself putting two carrots there, uh, setting two, two heads of lettuce there or two leaf, what kind of size you're going to need 
let's just say you happen to be growing a, a bib lettuce or, or head lettuce, iceberg. You know, you can't have an ice, two iceberg lettuce touching each other. That's just not enough room. So if you lay, imagine in your mind laying those in the garden, that's the kind of spacing you need. Now in the case of lettuce, in the case of carrots, you can slowly thin them as they get bigger and you can have baby carrots and utilize those. I told you about utilizing additional lettuce that you're thinning. Uh, you can do that with almost anything. Water, sun, we've talked about that. Very important. You know, here in Anaheim, it gets windy. We talked about the Santa Anas. So you wanna really be sure and be in tune with what you're doing. That's the whole fun of gardening and getting your hands dirty, and getting in there. Every time the Santa Anas blow, which are coming soon, if I was just to look at the surface of my garden after a Santa Ana day, as a layman, I would go and say, oh my gosh, they need watering immediately. But in fact, it's just that top layer of soil. So I always like to use a spade. I always have something laying around the garden where I can dig down three or four inches next to a plant and really get a feel for how moist it is or how dry, dry it is. So when I do that on the typical Santa Ana's, it's only a half inch of dry and the rest is plenty moist. And I told you overwatering is not necessarily a good thing. So you really need to stay in touch with how much water by looking at your soil and just being aware of it. Plus it's fun, get your hands dirty. Success of plants, I think I mentioned that with the leaf lettuce. Don't hesitate to go every couple of weeks or spread it out. So as one gets done, the other ones are coming mature. This is why I, I referenced this a couple of times, seed packets has all the information you need. The best time to plant, uh, mature height in this case and the rights, you know, it's a foot tall. I'm, what is this? I'm not even sure what kind of plant this is. Does it say somewhere? Oh, it's basil. Yeah, basil gets at least a foot tall. I love basil, that's a summer crop actually, as you can see, uh, May to June. Mild winters, May to July, it's still summertime. Full sun, we talked about full sun and an inch apart for starters. Some of the stuff you're gonna learn yourself, because I look at spacing seeds, well that, that's, that's planting them, um, is, is planting them an inch apart. Because I don't know if you're familiar with basil, we're seeing it grow, I happen to love basil. I love to grow it in between my tomatoes. Uh, they can be very, very large, and they flower a lot. I try to pinch the flowers off, but I also leave some to flower because the bees just absolutely love basil. So you've got to spread them out to the one foot as noted there. Best date to use, this happens to be a packet of 2010. If you're starting from seed and saving your seed, I told you a tomato packet might have 30 tomatoes in it. You're only gonna grow three or four of them each year. And you might only want to grow one, you grow three or four, so you can pick out the best one, give the rest to your friends or whatever you want to do. But now you've got a bunch of seeds left. So you keep them in an airtight container. We've all seen, and whether it's vitamins or something from Amazon or whatever, those little packets, of, it's called desiccant. It's designed to absorb moisture. And um, I like to save those put them in the bag with the seeds I'm saving in a Ziploc and then zip it tight. So you've got it relatively airtight and you have additional moisture protection by way of this moisture absorbing little packets. I know you've all seen those. So you can keep your seeds in some cases four or five, six years. This is a chart that we're gonna have available for you as a handout. If you print this on a non, color printer, it's just gonna be a big blur of black and gray. So print this on a color printer, but it's a good layman's early start. The dark green is the best time to start. Light green is not necessarily, it's coming toward the end and no color at all means do not plant it during that time of year. Uh, like, here's a good example. I'm just giving you some of my experience. In, in the event you may wanna grow broccoli, or cauliflower, and I'm gonna tell you, when you plant it at the exact right time, you are gonna be exceedingly successful and blown away that you actually grew that mega head of cauliflower or broccoli. It's a timing issue. So here you can see it's the one, two, three, fifth one down. It suggests you plant it October through February. 
Well, I'm telling you from experience right here in Southern California, you put them in in October, first week of October, more or less. Don't, don't chip that in stone, more or less, the first week of October, but don't wait too much past that. Because there's so much growth and they're such a big plant compared to other cool season, it gives them a chance in the hot, warm days to start that big, big vegetative growth. And then as it starts to cool off, all that vegetative growth is done and there's enough energy to make these big heads. If you put them in December, January, the plant itself just isn't gonna do as well and you will get broccoli, but the heads are gonna be real small. So that's another thing we talked about earlier is uh, experience, keeping a journal, making notes. And then you can go down there. Here's an eggplant. I told you how successful mine was. This is the first time looking at it. It says April or May. I'm planting mine in June. I just learned that this year. So this is a good chart to start with, but there are books. Again, Pat Welsh is a good one. Southern California Gardener. It's a month by month guy, Pat Welsh, W-E-L-C-H. And um, you might have to buy it used, but it's, it's a great gardener reference for, especially for new gardeners. Okay. These are just cool season crops. I talked to you about the, the peas and the, the green onions. You just start with those sets, beets. We, I've, I've talked about all this stuff. Kale, I happen to love kale. It's really good. Little secret if you eat kale and I happen to do a lot of cooking because I'm related to my garden and into that stuff. When you cut up kale into bite-sized pieces, a lot of people have a problem with the mouth feel and that hard in your mouth. If you take your kale ready, cut up and ready to have mouth size pieces, then you massage it hard, the entire, uh, or uh, whatever you're putting it in a container, and just crush it five or six heavy times. It breaks that hardness off us and release some sweetness. And if you don't like kale and you try what I just recommended there, you might decide to yourself, that is really good. By the way, kale happens to be high in available calcium, especially for women. If you're looking for something, I'd like to get more calcium besides taking a calcium peel. Peel, uh, pill. A lot of these cool season crops, especially kale, are very, very high in calcium and extremely good for you. Tasty too. <laughs> All right. I pretty much talked about this. You can see the um, planting tips, tickling the roots, you know, whatever they do in these commercial pots. I mean, I have got good roots in mine, but nothing like you see at the store. It's like a big wad of white. So they're all kind of tangled at the bottom. So you really need to, depending on how bad it is, either pinch that little bottom half inch off to expose roots growing down or tickle them, as they say, and break them down so the roots are not round, 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 all kind of stuck in, in, in a shape of that container. So that's important. A depth, pretty simple, with the exception of some like tomatoes, which we're not going to go into too much detail on. You plant them deeper than they are at the soil level. But the overall basic rule is you plant that seed at the same depth that it has been grown in the container. Success of plantings, we've talked about that. So some are, I, I think we mentioned this, what's best from seed and what's best to transplant. Uh, as you can see, the carrots, that sort of thing, um, they just don't like to be transplanted. Radishes, that, that sort of thing. So. Just be aware if seeds don't work for you, because seeds takes a little bit of effort. If you're beginning gardeners, just go ahead and buy, buy the plant and, and try to avoid, a, a, nothing wrong with a big box store, but just go to the little local nursery. They're gonna have a better selection and I think a, a healthier set of plants. These are guess the name. So I'm guessing those are fava beans. Hey. Watermelon radish, obviously I've done this talk, we'll go on and <laughs> this radish. Uh, this is gonna be pak choy, love that stuff. Another easy to grow, great container, delicious. Fresh pak choy is, is amazing. And the celery root. Where to grow, we've talked about that. I think uh, I don't wanna beat that up. So here we go, in ground. Again, another angle of my garden there. And then in containers, which uh, I, th I think based on the age, I understand most of you probably are a little younger. I think containers might, might be where you're going. 
please, when we're done here, I'm trying to inspire you here, go get some soil, get some kind of container. If you don't do anything else, put some lettuce in there. Buy a six pack, a 12 pack, throw it in there. And in, in the six weeks, you'll be picking lettuce and thinking to yourself, man, I'm glad that guy convinced me. Now in this particular pot, I see artichokes in the middle. It, you better read up on that. That artichoke thing could be six feet tall and that's the rest of the rest of that garden. So artichokes, I wouldn't plant in a container. So we're back to the soil. I kind of talked about that. Uh, there's lots of organic soil. There's one of those uh, compost bags or a homemade bag. It happens to say compost, but that's the kind you can grow anything. You can call that instead of the whiskey barrel, which I've just, just been using as a reference, you could certainly grow it in that. Full sun, five hours, call it six. Trust me on that one. Five is just not enough. Easy to water, taller plants to the north. There's that artichoke again, that's just not gonna happen. Uh, the larger the container, the better, of course. Uh, some of this is repetitive, I apologize for that. Uh, Brian, we have a, a question. Yes, please. Sorry to interrupt. Um, when you're growing in a container, do you wanna place holes in the bottom um, for proper drainage or does it is it important for drainage or what are your thoughts on that? That is a fantastic question and if I didn't make that clear, I'm sure glad you asked it, thank you absolutely have to have holes in the bottom. Drainage could be one of the most important things when, when, when growing something. You have to have them drained. So that's a simple straightaway answer. Holes are absolutely required. There's no other, no other option. Pretty straightforward. So you see that how many radishes they got in there? Again, I told you I do a lot of cooking. So radishes are like, eh, I'm not really crazy about radishes. You take a radish, you cut it from stem to root that direction in half, blanch them for about four or five minutes in boiling water, put them in ice water to stop the cooking, returning to a fry pan with a little butter, a little nutmeg, and you'll, re you'll think of a radish as a whole different animal. Cooked radishes are unbelievable. Easy to grow, easy to cook. Carrots, you can see them coming up out of there. Um, some of those smaller ones, you know, depend, if you're aware of the size of them, you can pick the smaller ones first. You can usually tell if you scoot the very top of the soil to see the shoulder, if you will, what size carrot it is. You don't have to feel obligated to pull it. Well, that's not as big as I thought it was. I'll stick it back in, that won't work. But once you get a little experience and you start to look at the shoulder, you realize, you know, that one's a little smaller and needs to be thin. I'm gonna take that and eat it, eat it as a baby carrot. So now we got artichokes all by themselves. See how big that thing gets? That's a single pot, nothing else growing in there. <clears throat> of course, citrus you can grow in a pot. If you're gonna buy, if you really want some citrus and grow it in a pot, I just leave it in that big container. As long as you have limited space and maybe temporary, whatever your situation may be, it's not gonna be forever. Leave it in the pot you grow it in. It's gonna have holes in it. Put a nice bottom on it. You don't want to make a mess on anything, so it can uh, retain the water. Blueberries are very particular about their soil. They like an acidic soil under 7.0 on the pH scale. That's very hard to maintain in the ground. So blueberries are really pot favorable. So just keep that on. Potatoes, we talked about that. Squash, it, it's just, it's just a, a version of, I don't know whose garden that is, but that thing is gorgeous. That just allows you to plant with your decorative uh, landscaping and add some fruits and vegetables in there. So. Um, that, that thing is really, really nice. All right, let's quickly talk about this as I see my time's about done and I don't want to make it any, uh, any longer than, than need be. Integrated pest management, I really encourage you to look that up. It is, deals with proper way to deal with any insects you may have. You just don't go willy nilly and spray a bunch of insecticide on anything. In this particular case, let's just say that was a, a, a leaf hopper or in a tomato, it would be a, a hornworm, both in the caterpillar families. You would use a thing called BT, Bacillus thurnogenesis. Basically, we'll call it BT. It's a bacteria, a microorganism that is only toxic when in contact with the enzymes in a caterpillar stomach. Now, how selective is that? Tests show that it's completely inert, 
it doesn't break down the way it does in a caterpillar stomach, inert completely to humans and considered organic. So when you're trying to really do integrated pest management, let's just say you have some other flowers that you've deliberately grown to attract butterflies. Well, those are caterpillars. So you just need to be cautious of not using that widespread. Keep it to there, keep it off your, your butterfly attractants. And I'm just using that as an example. So uh, in my case, snails, agapanthus, they love agapanthus. So I never, I make sure I never have agapanthus near my garden because it's basically a snail farm. And then you're trying to deal with snails. So you can deal with them in the agapanthus. You don't have to do all this snail and slug killer in your garden if you deal with them at the source. That's just one small example of what integrated pest management, it's very, very important. So here it is right here. Uh, the control methods I just discussed, a compatible manner is exactly what I was talking about to minimize the effect on the, on the environment. And I'll tell you, sometimes when you have a small garden, it just, it's just not gonna work. I had a problem several years ago with some green beans. I don't care what I did, whatever insect that was, it wouldn't go away but I was doing safer soap, blasts of water, all these organic methods, but I could not win. So I just pulled them out, got them out of the garden. I didn't have green beans that year. So just be prepared for that. All right, we wanna make sure as we talk about gardening, we're talking about our planet. We wanna protect our watersheds, of course. If you're using a chemical, use it as directed, because you know, no matter what you do, it, go, it ends up in the ocean, whatever, if you have a lawn, if that's your situation and you're pouring diazinon or something to control ants, at some point that's going into the ocean. So you just want to really be a steward of the land uh, and our mother earth, of course, just, just be cautious. So hopefully I've inspired you today and I've delivered as promised that we've talked about these different topics and you've learned them. So if you don't do anything else, get out there and get gardening. Thanks for listening. Tom, would you like to cover these handouts? Looks like they went away. Hopefully everybody's still there. You never know with Zoom. But in any event, here's our website. Yeah, go ahead. I'm still here, Brian. I'm All right, go typing. ahead. Somebody cover this, if you will. Tom or Linda? Linda, you have the- well, uh, I've been busy typing like for the past 45 minutes. Yeah, so. Me too. I don't oh, so you really love my talk, huh? <laughs> I'm typing as fast as I can. Yeah, I, you're not the only one. Uh, probably the best place to go is to the uh, hotline or the uh, Master Gardener website that I think was on the screen there a minute ago. No, it's up there. Yeah, okay. Uh, go to the, write these, take these down, write them down. Uh, the top one is a website. There's all <laughs> kinds of uh, clicks, click spaces on there where you can get all kinds of information on various things from A to Z, uh, fruits to nuts, uh, everything that's possible. If you got a specific gardening question, I would suggest that you use the second line there, the which is our hotline, and you will get an answer back from some of the smartest people in the Master Gardener program. Probably within uh, 24 hours, uh, they'll respond and start working on your uh, question. Everybody should take a picture of it. I would like to put a big plug in for the hotline. I'm the hotline lead, and uh, with all this uh, interest in gardening, when people were cooped up in their homes and they started gardening, uh, we were just swamped with questions and it's it's starting to taper off now, but we're ready to uh, handle yours. I know I sent in some private uh, message. Uh, I put our hotline resource. If you are watching from another location, there's master gardeners in every state and in California, I know they're in every county. So you'll be able to find a local resource that will be familiar with your growing conditions where you live. Yes, thank you. And if I may, one more time, as Linda said, that, that middle one right there, write that down. Because as I described in all these different situations, that is a hotline. Master gardeners are answering the question. It's based on uh, scientifically researched and peer-reviewed information for right here in Southern California. So 
Uh, you can take a picture, send it in, whatever the case may be. It is the ultimate resource. And if you want to start gardening and you're not sure for any reason, we're here for you on that hotline. So with that said, well, I guess that wraps um, it up. Uh, thank you for yes, listening. And, um, I hope I've inspir uh, uh, inspired you. Go out and get gardening. Thank you very much. Um, and for those of you still uh, attending, we will be sending out a follow-up email um, in, the, in the next week or so. And that will include a link to the YouTube video when that's released, as well as the contact information included in this last slide. Um, I want to thank you all for taking time out of your, your evenings and, and spending it with us and the Master Gardeners. Um, thank you so much for answering all of our questions. I know all of us are eager to learn and to grow our own vegetables and you did a fantastic job. Thank you so much. Thanks again, everybody. Thank bye you. Bye.